So, so the Fermilab accelerator system is made up of a chain of these accelerators. Uh, each delivering particles to down to the next accelerator downstream. You've got the cock of Walton, which has 750 keV. Then you've got the linear accelerator. So here is the cock of Walton. Then you have the linear accelerator, which takes the beams from uh, 750 uh, uh, keV up to 400 MeV. Then the beam goes into the booster. And it gets another boost of the GEV. And then there's a transfer line that takes the beam and transfers it to the next machine, which is the main injector. And that takes the beam from 8 GEV to 150 GEV. And then the beam goes to the Capitron, which takes the beam at 150 GEV and takes it up to about 1 TEV, ready 0.98 TEV. Uh, there's a couple other accelerators, the antiproton accumulator and the recycler, that I'll show here in a second. So let's look at these accelerators. You got the uh, everything starts out here in the cock of Walton, and inside this machine you have a bottle of hydrogen, uh, which is combined with cesium to produce H, mi H ions, H minus ions, and these uh, H minus ions are tra attracted towards uh, the wall here with this potential. Uh, through the column and gain speed and energy. Uh, the final kinetic energy from that is uh, 0.75 MeV, which is 0.04 speed of light. They then enter the linear accelerator upstream and uh, of LINAP. The field inside the LINAP oscillates at 200 megahertz. And what happens when the particles come in, they get a kick in between the gaps. And as they get go faster and faster, the space in between the gaps uh, get further uh, as they accelerate the particles. The gap spacing has to change, so the gap gaps get spaced further apart as the particle speed increases. And downstream of the LINAP, the particle speed gets to about 0.7 c. Uh, the gap spacing doesn't change much now for you approaching uh, close to speed of light, and you use a different cavity structure. Uh, this is the picture of that structure uncovered. Uh, here the fields now oscillate about 800 megahertz. Uh, the total length of the LENAC is 475 feet. I thought it was more than 600, but I think that's the number that came with it. And the final kinetic energy is 400 MeV. Uh, somewhere along the way, particles get extracted off to do something we call neutron therapy. And I'm not going to talk much about that because there's a talk about that in a week or two. So here's the booster synchrotron, the magnets, here's the RF cavities, really, that's this machine right here. So the, at the entrance, uh, the electrons are stripped away from the H minus ions, leaving protons. The protons uh, circle the booster 20,000 times and gain 7,600 MeV in kinetic energy. They exit traveling at 99% the speed of light. The total process takes about uh, 0.033 seconds. The main injector, uh, these are the magnets that I've shown before, this is the RF. Um, uh, particles enter the eight gel, uh, with eight gel and accelerated to 150 GeV, 0.999C. It has many uses in, in this machine. Uh, some protons and antiprotons, uh, are, are, some protons are used uh, to produce antiprotons in the source, uh, in the antiproton source. Uh, some of the uh, antiprotons uh, go into the re recycler, and uh, protons go to the tepertron, and antiprotons go to the tepertron, and then you have other experiments that use the, uh, the beam as well uh, for producing uh, for neutrino experiments, and there's an experiment in Minnesota, a detector in Minnesota, and the neutrinos that are produced are, are sent uh, through on the ground to this uh, location uh, called NUMI, Aminos. Uh, the antiproton source takes 120 GeV uh, protons from the uh, main injector <coughs> and it strikes a target and it produces lots of particles every uh, two seconds or so. Uh, eight JEV antiprotons are filtered out and, uh, and stored in there. On the go, a process called stochastic cooling in order to, to keep them together. 
So you take about 10 hours to produce all these antiprotons. And the way the antiproton source work, you got a, you have a, a proton beam comes and it hits a, a, a target made out of inconel. Inconel is a nickel alloy, and is a, a very very strong uh, magnet that takes these particles and bends the antiprotons out. And the other particles that are produced, they go off, but they have different uh, energies. And so you produce the antiprotons. This thing runs at 650 kiloamps. This lithium lens here. Uh, in the, in the, the collisions, many particles are created besides the, uh, the antiprotons. And for every one million protons that hit the antiproton target, you only get about 20 HF uh, P bars. So you need, you need to then pick these particles and accumulate them and do this for many hours in order to get enough uh, antiprotons. And there's uh, some other scenarios that we use here. In the main injector right above it is another machine called the uh, recycler. And uh, this recycler is also a way to store uh, antiprotons. I'm going to accelerate a little bit here because time is getting. Uh, one of the processes I want to tell you about is electron cooling of the antimatter. Uh, every container uh, has a limit to how much stuff you can actually put in it. So what happens is that you get to a practical limit where you try to store antiprotons as well. Uh, so what you can do, you can either uh, transfer the beam to a bigger vessel, that's what we do, we put it in the recycler, and you use a more aggressive system for cooling the particles. And the way electron cool, cooling works, you take a stored ion beam is, uh, and you make it overlap with a part of the, uh, the, the, the uh, common area in the ring, like in the recycler ring, this would be the recycler ring. You, about one to five percent of that ring so conference is shared with the electron cooling. And what happens is that you produce electrons and you allow these electrons to uh, to be collinear in a common section with the antiprotons. So that you get a mix in between the protons and the antiprotons in the cooling section is called. And in this section, when you mix the hot antiprotons with the cold electron beam, you essentially lower the, the, the equilibrium temperature of the beam itself. So it's really like mixing a hot and cold gas. You take a hot gas and a cold gas, you mix it, and you lower the temperature of the particles. And I'm not going to spend a lot of time on the mechanics of that, but um, the ions essentially undergo a Coulomb scattering because they have the same charge and uh, there's an energy exchange. So this is what the pellitron looks like. It's that Van de Graaff machine I showed you, and inside this vessel is pressurized with sulfur hexafluoride gas, it's at SF6. And that's the insulator. And the earlier I showed you the charging mechanism that the chains that rotate inside this thing. Uh, so the electrons that are produced in this machine, they come out, they go in, they get bent into uh, the recycler ring. This is the recycler ring right here. This will be the cooling section. And the antiprotons are coming this way, the electrons are going this way, they interact in this region. The electrons are light and they get bent away and then back and back to the machine and the energy gets recovered the antiprotons continue on their merry way, having taken some energy, uh, given some energy up to the electron. And then there's the Tevatron. Uh, Tevatron is still the world's highest energy particle accelerator for now. Uh, it was commissioned in 1983. It replaced the uh, 400 gem main ring, uh, and it was in the same tunnel. Uh, it was the first conducting accelerator it has a circumference, this should be a pi in there, not a box, of four miles. Uh, uh, at one TeV, uh, protons and antiprotons, uh, the speed is about 0.99 C, and one round trip for a proton takes about 21 microseconds uh, in the tevatron. That's 48,000 revolutions per second. Uh, acceleration takes place with uh, eight RF cavities, total of, uh, over a total of 20 uh, meter distance. And the rest of the circumference is magnets and, and, and for bringing particles uh, back to the cavities and so on. Uh, 